I threw together a talk on um, communication in honeybees. I think in addition, you know, in conjunction with division of labor, communication is the other cornerstone of how a, a colony works. And I think there's a lot of sort of um, underappreciated aspects of, of how complex honeybee communication is, how they all coordinate their activities. So everybody is more or less familiar with the waggle dance. And when, people, when, when you say the dance language of the honeybee, people usually think you're referring to the, the waggle dance. The waggle dance is actually one of many dances that the, that the bees do. It's the most elaborate, it's the most information rich. It's definitely the coolest one, but, but there are lots of other dances that the bees use. And the waggle dance is one of these dances that sort of bit, makes up what we call the dance language. So the main ones, there's lots of signals that the honeybees have, but I think the main ones that make up what um, we call the dance language are the, the waggle dance, the tremble dance, the stop signal, and the shaking signal. So three of these, the waggle dance, the tremble dance, and the shaking signal are really easy to see. You might have seen them in your colonies. If you set up an observation hive, you'll be sure to see them. I'll show you some videos for what they look like. The stop signal is a little harder to see. I'll show you a video of that as well. More of an acoustic thing. So before we get to that, I, I thought I'd spend a couple minutes talking about how we figure out you know, what signals mean in animal behavior. There are lots of ways that we do this, but this is sort of the most straightforward way. And it's sort of, it's kind of commonsensical in, in that you try to find the context in which the signal is produced. So for example, meerkats and lots of, you know, um, animal, small animals like that have alarm calls. And so you might notice that a sentinel like that meerkat there in the picture produces a certain call when a hawk flies over and then you notice the response of the receiver, which is to run for cover. Those two things, you know, go together kind of like a hand in glove. The context is, you know, suggests it's an alarm call. The response also suggests it's an alarm call. Lots of sexual signals are like that. You might notice that the, the context is always a male in the breeding season. The receiver is a female. The response is either to accept or reject him. And so, Usually the, the first pass we make when we're trying to figure out what a signal means is to figure out the context that it's produced and what is the response of the receiver. And then we try to figure out, you know, based on that, what the signal means. It doesn't always work, but, but sometimes it does. So the first of these signals is called the stop signal. I have a little video of it here. It's a really short video, so I'll play it a couple of times so you can see what it looks like. So this bee that's coming in and making the buzzing and the headbutting motion, that's the bee that's producing the stop signal. And she's, pet, she's, she's directing the signal to this marked bee here. And this marked bee is a forager. So this bee was you know, um, trained to visit a forager at the, at, the, at the feeder, the researcher who's James Nye at UCSD, marked her with these dots in the Von Frisch sort of style where you put two dots to signify a, a number. And then that bee went back to the nest and received the stop signal. So I'll just show you one more time. This bee right here is coming in. So pretty much for all of these signals, that when, you, when you do sophisticated acoustical analysis on them, they all have a characteristic frequency that differs from one to the other. It's also the case that um, they differ in duration. And it's sometimes it's also the case that they're, they have um, substrate vibration components or near field sound components as well. So there's a lot of sort of stuff that goes into figuring out, you know, in more detail from a neuroethology sort of perspective, what the signal means, but, but we don't necessarily have to go into that much. So what does it mean? So for a long time, this, it wasn't known what this signal means. And I should say that the, con the, the, the meaning that I'm gonna give is clearly one of many meanings because they produce this signal in many different contexts, and we don't know the meaning of it in all of the contexts. But James was able to figure out one of the meetings by using the, the, the this experiment um, with feeders. And so basically what he did was he trained the bees out to a feeder, the foragers, they go to the feeder, they go back to the nest, they recruit with the waggle dance, more bees go out to the feeder. And so what James did is he harassed the foragers at the feeder by pinching their legs and basically harassing them, sort of mimicking what might happen if a predator you know, made a lunge at them or something. And what he noticed is that the foragers that, went, that then went back to the nest after being harassed at the feeder, those are the bees that received the stop signal. 
And those bees responded by stopping their waggle dance. And so the bees, when they normally they go to a feeder, it's a really rich nectar source because you give them a lot of really rich nectar. They fly back, they do the waggle dance to recruit more bees to go out to that feeder. When they receive the stop signal, they basically stop dancing and they give up on that site. So it seems to be a signal that, you know, essentially stop sending more bees to this place where there is danger. And so for whatever reason, if this if this site is no longer productive, it's no longer valuable, the bees basically have the ability to rapidly turn off the waggle dance, to tell other bees to stop dancing, stop going to that place. The other two signals are, um, they're more common. They're, you can see them being done all the time. They're also um, more important maybe. And they have to do with coordinating the, the activities of the bees that are specialized for different tasks. And so the, the bees are basically doing three different things, the foragers and the, the middle-aged bees. That's the, the house bees that are older than the nurses, but younger than the foragers. So those bees process the nectar into honey, and they also build new comb, and the foragers collect food. But the foragers collect food, but they don't process it. They don't, they don't make bee bread, for example. The middle-aged bees do that. The foragers also don't make honey. They collect nectar, but they unload it to the middle-aged bees at the bottom of the hive in the area we call the dance floor. And then the middle-aged bees process the, the nectar into honey. So these three tasks have to be coordinated. You have to have the right number of individuals allocated to each of these different tasks if, if it's gonna flow with sort of an optimum you know, um, unity of purpose. So for example, if there were you know, way too many foragers and not enough processors, foraging would have to shut down because there would be nobody to take to, to unload the nectar receivers as they come in. And likewise, if there weren't enough bees working on building new comb, then they would run out of space. And so as you know, from when the nectar flow gets going, they can very quickly fill up the entire hive, you know, with, with, um, with, fresh, with fresh nectar and honey. And so they have to sort of be ahead of that. They have to sort of make sure that they're, they're producing enough comb before they need it so they don't run out of space. You have to make sure that they have enough nectar receivers and processors to unload and process the food as it comes in from the foragers. And so it's most of the communication in the hive has to do with coordinating the activities of these three individuals. Well, they're not individuals, but these three different groups of individuals. Kind of like if you're making a fence or something and you have somebody laying bricks and somebody mixing cement and somebody on a wheelbarrow taking the cement from the person who's making it over to the person laying the bricks. Maybe you can have one person laying bricks and one person you know, mixing cement and three people doing the carrying or something like that. The idea being that there's some optimal ratio. Some of these things are, some of these tasks are easier than others. And so to make it all flow, you have to allocate the right number of individuals. And you might tell the people mixing to go faster because I'm running out of cement, or you know, might tell the people carrying it to go faster or slower, or get somebody else to help with bricks, that, that kind of thing. So the bees are doing the same things. They're basic, almost all of their signals have to do with do, allocating more effort to processing or to building or to collecting to better coordinate their activities. So this signal, the tremble dance, is the, is the next one we're, we'll talk about. This is actually a, a, a two-part video. So um, this bee is going to tremble dance here. The, the microphone right there, that, that's the tremble dance. It kind of looks like a discombobulated waggle dance. Instead of doing the nice figure eight sort of pattern, they do the abdominal waggling. But it's, it's not in any, like here's the waggle dance. You can see it's a stereotype. They always waggle in the same direction and they make the figure eight and go back. Here's a treble dancer over here. So this is the, the treble dance here. So this signal has been known for a long time. It's, 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 really, it's really easy to notice because the bees that do it do it for a very long period of time. So you might see an individual bee like that doing this tremble dance for 20 minutes straight. And they and when they do it, they'll walk all over the nest, you know, doing this, doing this signal. So they're they're only the foragers that that do this signal. They're going back and forth, but then they suddenly stop foraging and instead they start doing this signal for a very long time. 
So it's, it's kind of like the stop signal in that it seems to have multiple functions. One of the functions was figured out by Tom Seeley. He talks about it in his book, The Wisdom of the Hive, which I would you know, recommend to everybody. It's a really good book about um, how, how honeybees coordinate their foraging activities. And so Tom did an experiment. He suspected that the, this, this signal is used to call up more labor to nectar receiving and nectar and, and honey production in the middle age bees to increase their activities. So he did an experiment in which he removed the receiver bees from the nest during a, a period of good nectar flow and then observed the foragers. And so if it, if it is a signal to sort of coordinate the activities of the nectar receivers and the nectar foragers, and if we remove a bunch of nectar receivers, you should see a lot of this signal. You should see the foragers basically calling for more labor because you removed some labor that was necessary. And that's basically what he found. <laughs> He found that the foragers, after he removed the nectar receivers, started producing huge numbers of these tremble dances. And as I mentioned before, the receivers of this are, are everybody. So the, one of the ways you know the, the waggle dance, for example, is for other foragers, is that they only produce that signal in the dance floor area at the bottom of the hive where the foragers hang out. But when they make this tremble dance, they purposely leave that area where the foragers are and they walk all throughout the nest doing this trembling dance essentially broadcasting to the whole nest, you know, whatever the signal means. And we think it means increase your efforts, you know, towards nectar collection. So it, it, he showed that after the, after the burst of tremble dances was completed, there was an increase in nectar receiving and the, and the equilibrium between the collection and the processing of the honey, you know, got back in balance and the foraging could then, you know, commence again. I should mention that in that in that little triangle I showed, there was foraging and nectar and you know honey production and then comb building. Comb building is not terribly well understood. It's not as well understood as the as the other aspects of the problem. The last one is the most charismatic. That it kind of looked this this shaking signal looks just like what it the just looks just like the name. Probably have seen this in your hives. A bee grabs another bee and basically shakes her. It's similar to the tremble dance in that when they do this signal, they do it for a long period of time. You'll see a bee tremble doing this shaking signaling, this shaking signal for like 20 minutes at a time. And they'll walk all over the hive doing it as well. They also don't just shake other bees, they'll also shake the, the comb, the, the comb itself. And so it seems most of these signals are are received either as sound waves or substrate vibrations or both. We think both, but it's really hard to tell the difference in that it's hard to sort of do those experiments where you turn off one sensory modality and not the other, but we think it's through both sound waves and also substrate vibrations. So when is it produced? It's produced, there's a, it's produced all day long. You can go into your hive at pretty much any time of the day and see some bees doing the, the, um, the shaking signal, but there's a big burst of it in the morning and there's another burst of it at night. There's a sort of peak in this signal in the morning and then another peak in the, at the end of the day. And it's the foragers who, who produce this signal. It's pretty much the foragers who do 95% of honeybee mechanical signals, these shaking, vibrating, dancing, acoustic type signals, they're almost all produced by the, the foragers, with some exceptions. I mean, the queen has a piping signal and the workers have some signals, but they have one or two signals. But well, actually, what I'm saying is it's the foragers that do the signals, the, the, the workers that are not foragers, like the within nest bees, they don't, they don't, do, they don't do many of these signals. Hopefully I'm, you know, hopefully I'm, you're following what I'm saying. I'm usually asleep at this time. I have a, we have a baby and our other daughter is five. And so they, I'm usually asleep by eight o'clock. And so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to rally to, to stay awake. So as I said, it's the foragers that, that make the signal. Everyone receives it because the shaking signal bees walk all throughout the hive making the signal. And then what people notice is that there's either an increase or a decrease in activity after this burst of shaking signals. And so what we think it means is, we think it's kind of like a work bell. We think in the morning, it means that the workday is starting 
And at the end of the day, it means the workday is ending. And so it's, what it seems to be doing is the foragers seem to be telling all the bees in the nest that they're starting their workday. The nectar receivers should all get activated and go down to the dance floor area and be ready to receive nectar. And then at the end of the day, they're telling them the, the foraging day is over. You don't need to do nectar receiving anymore. You can allocate yourself to all the other things that the middle-aged bees do. So those are the, the mechanical signals. The rest of the time, I, I thought we talked about pheromones. Pheromones are often thought of as sort of the core communication system for social insects. There are two different types of pheromones. They're what we call primary pheromones. These are pheromones that cause slow developmental changes. So for example, the queen pheromone suppresses the activation of ovaries and the workers. When the queen is missing, the workers will turn on their ovaries. That sort of physiological change is what we associate with a primary pheromone. Releaser pheromones are pheromones that elicit a very rapid, purely behavioral response, not a change in physiology or development, but rather just a, a rapid behavioral response. And so the classic example of that are the alarm pheromones. They, they elicit, you know, an, uh, they facilitate an attack. <clears throat> so social insects have often been called sort of exocrine gland batteries. Exocrine glands are the glands that produce pheromones. Social insects have many more of these glands than, than solitary insects do. And we think that this expansion in this glandular system sort of facilitates social behavior by allowing them to have all of these different novel pheromones that have you know, social functions. This is the honeybee with, with most of their glands. The, the head has three glands, the mandibular glands, the hypopharyngeal glands, and these, um, these salivary glands, which in the honeybee actually has two separate parts and, they, and these could be called two separate glands. They have different functions. Then there are the wax glands, there's the venom gland, the Dufour's gland, Mazinoff gland, there are some tarsal glands as well. There are a couple other glands. The honeybee has a lot of glands and most of them serve you know, various social functions. So overall in social insects, these are sort of the, the classic functions that pheromones serve. They serve alarm functions. They, they can be alarm pheromones that can facilitate aggregation. They can be used in foraging for marking trails, marking flowers, sexual pheromones, reproductive pheromones. Those are fertility signals the queen honeybee has has that. There's colony membership. All social insects have that. They can recognize self versus non-self and self is member of the colony and the non-self is not a member of the colony. So the honeybee is, we, we know about 50, we've identified about 50 pheromones. It's not clear how many signals they represent because many of them work together in complex blends, but um, Essentially, they have, they have a lot of this stuff such that if you think about them as an organism, as a super organism, they have sort of a, a reasonably sophisticated, you know, physiology. And, you know, um, yeah, that, that, that is facilitated by the coordinating mechanisms that the pheromones serve. So we're just going to run through the, the, the major um, pheromone systems and how they work in bees. So nestmate recognition is um, probably the, the, the system that's the question that's received the most work is queen pheromones and reproductive signaling. We'll talk about that after. But after that, the context that's received the most attention is nestmate recognition. So here we, we think that the, there's sort of a conceptual model that we like to use, which sort of encapsulates how we think it works. And we, have, we think that there are labels. These are cues that are or signals that are produced by the individual sort of, you know, um, identifiers. Then the individual, then every individual also has a template, which is a set of labels that they use to define self and, and non-self. It's usually their own labels. And so what we think happens is the individual compares their labels to the, Indian, to the other individual that they encounter. And if there's a match, there's acceptance. And if there's not a match, there's rejection. But it's actually a little easier to follow the, the concept if you just look at some data that illustrates how it works. So we think that the labels are these, well, we know that the labels are these um, cuticular hydrocarbons. 
These are waxy lipids. And it's a complex blend of hydrocarbons that's used as the, as the label. And so if you look at this, like a hydrocarbon is just a long carbon hydrogen chain. It can have double bonds. It could have methyl groups. These are these branches right here. And so with these things, they have a, they're sort of named according to how long the backbone chain is and then where the branches are. But the branches can be anywhere. So you could have you know, one that's 15 long, or you can have one that's 18 long, or you can have one that's 15 long, but has a branch at three or carbon seven or carbon nine. And so it's really easy to create sort of a, a large diversity of these compounds just by varying their length and varying where the side groups are. So the way Nesme recognition works is if you look at these chromatographs and a chromatograph is just a, a readout of the chemicals that are in an extraction. So you sort of, you, you wash the, the bee's body with some compound like hexane or alcohol, something that washes off these, these labels. And then you run them through this machine called the gas chromatograph. And each, what comes out is, the, is, a, is a reading like this. And so each of these peaks represents a different chemical compound, one of these hydrocarbons. And then the height of the peak corresponds to how much of that compound was in the extraction. So if you look here, there's three different ant species here and they have very different profiles. They have very different hydrocarbons. There's, you know, they have a couple in common, like they both, they, both of these species have this peak right here, but they have lots of peaks that are not in common. And it's really easy to see that if you were using this as your template, and you encountered somebody that had this set of labels, you would easily reject them. So that's between species. Within species, it, it, it's the same principle, but it's, it's more fine, it's more fine-tuned. And so this is for the honeybee. And these are three different colonies. And so you can see that they all have the same labels. They all have the same peaks, the same one, two, three, four, five, six big peaks. But what but they have differences in the amount of of compound in each of the peaks. And so, for example, this one here has a lot more of this peak than this one does. They also have more of this one than this one, but this one has, A has more of this peak than B does. And so there's sort of quantitative differences all along the same peaks. And so if you're doing a comparison, if this is your template and you compared it to this, there are quantitative differences that you can use to reject that individual. Whereas all the individuals within your nest would be very, very close to you. So it's sort of like a barcode. Everybody in the nest has a barcode of these hydrocarbons, these waxy lipids on their bodies. They smell another individual. They compare their own smell basically to another individual. And their olfactory system is sophisticated enough to tell these differences in quantity of these different compounds. And people have done experiments whereby you can, you know, you can you can chemically synthesize these hydrocarbons, then you can add them. You can just put them onto the cuticle of an individual that was previously accepted and then they get rejected. You can you know, add one or two and try to figure out how sensitive they are and lots and lots of experiments have been done. But this is the basic sort of mechanism for, for how it works. So as I said, the queen pheromones have been studied for the longest and maybe the most is known about them. Well, I guess what I would say is that the queen pheromones have been studied the longest. People have been studying these very rigorously since the 1960s. But because the queen pheromones are harder to understand and more complex than the nest mate recognition pheromones, the reproductive signaling is probably less well understood, even though there's more work on it. So the queen is producing the most pheromone signal of, of all the bees in the nest on a B by B basis, she has the most pheromones. I mean, she has the most, she has the most things to do, right? She's the, she's one bee that's doing these, all these vital tasks. And she basically has a lot of signaling to do to tell the hive that they have a, they have a queen, they have a healthy queen, they have, you know, a queen that's moving around the way she's supposed to and so forth. So most of the work is focused on this queen mandibular gland pheromone. If you, they sell this at the bee supply stores. QMP. It's what elicits the retinue. So here's a queen that you know is surrounded by her retinue of workers. Most of this response is caused by this QMP signal. So the the, the story is actually really complicated and, and a little convoluted. So 
It's called queen mandibular gland pheromone because it's made by the mandibular glands of the queen. But it's, it's also the case that it's not just made by the mandibular glands of the queen. So people have done experiments where you remove the, the mandibular glands from queens and they can, still, they can still elicit a retinue. And they can also still signal their fertility. They can still suppress the ovaries of the workers. And so those are the major functions of this queen pheromone. They suppress worker ovaries, they elicit the retinue. Even queens without mandibular glands can still do those things. And so it's thought that maybe the, the Dufour's gland and maybe some other glands also contribute to the signal. But it's clear that the mandibular gland is the major source of this signal, but it's not the only source. It's composed of five major chemicals that people have worked out. There's also three or four minor chemicals that increase the, you know, the strength of their response. And the QMP, the, if you buy those impregnated, you know, those impregnated um, little, um, little bands to sort of put into your hive to mimic them being queen right, that's just the five major chemicals. Those chemicals don't actually elicit as strong a response as the whole queen extract. And so if you extract all the compounds on the queen and you compare that just to the, the five major chemicals that make up QMP, the, the whole extract is much stronger in its effect. And so, that's how we know that the signal is much more than just QMP. But the work on it is still sort of ongoing. And the, the take home story is that the, 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 the bottom line is that chemistry is very hard outside of a few contexts. And so as soon as you get to more complex compounds than hydrocarbons, you get to things that have polar groups and rings and things like that, it's much, much harder to do the you know, the isolation of individual compounds and do the tests. And so it's just really difficult. So this compound's used in, you know, queen replacement, swarming, development, you know, suppressing the worker ovaries, all of these things. Essentially the worker, you know, the queen is signaling her presence and her fertility to the hive with this, this queen pheromone. An interesting question that sort of, you know, grows out of this, this question of, of QMP is sort of how does the signal get broadcast to the whole nest? Because it's not a terribly volatile pheromone. And so pheromones can either be contact-based or volatile. And, and so volatile ones are like perfumes where somebody's wearing strong perfume in the room and everybody in the room can very quickly smell it. That's something that travels over a long distance as opposed to some compounds that are sticky that you, know, you might mark something, but you have to get right up close to it. So lots of mammals, for example, will use territorial marks that are contact-based. They'll mark some post, and then an individual, another, spe another member of the species has to get pretty close to sort of to smell it and get right in there to, to smell it. And so the, the queen pheromone is not volatile like a perfume. And so it, it's more of a contact thing. So the question is, how does the queen you know, effectively broadcast to the whole nest her, her contact-based pheromone? So Tom Seeley worked this out in the 70s when he was a, I think he was a grad student. Some of the nurses act as messenger bees. A lot of the bees in this retinue, for example, they're constantly licking the queen. And then they, you know, they groom themselves. They basically get the queen pheromone all over their own bodies. And then they basically rush about the whole nest, brushing up against everybody and spreading this signal to everybody. So Tom collected some data showing that this is the this is the control bee that didn't encounter the queen. This is one of these bees in the retinue after she encountered the queen. She basically runs all over the place, brushing up against lots and lots of bees, spreading the queen signal everywhere. So what that means in terms of swarming is that the, some people think, for example, that it's crowding in the nest that causes, the, the, causes swarming. There's not enough room and the queen can't, the queen can't get her signal all around. That's not the case. And so it doesn't really actually matter how crowded the nest is. The QMP signal projects just as strongly whether the nest is uncrowded or crowded. It turns out that to control swarming, it seems as though the QMP signal has to work in conjunction with the tarsal gland signal. So the tarsal gland signal, the tarsal gland is the, the tarsus is the foot. That's just the scientific name of the, of the, of the foot. And so there's also a gland, there are also glands on the queen's feet. And those are leaving foot marks as she walks around. And so that's sort of the, the more direct measurement of crowding in the nest than is QMP, the, the foot mark signal is. So it's actually the QMP signal plus the foot mark signal that suppresses you know, the, the production of new, 
of new um, queens prior to swarming. But swarming is also not terribly well understood. Of, of all of the big topics in honeybee biology, I would say swarming is far and away the least well understood. And the reason for that, you know, incidentally, in case you're interested, is that it's sort of a bee-specific trait. In science, it's really hard to get funding to do things that are not perceived as being generally important for everything. And so every, every you know, species has reproduction, for example, and reproductive signaling in general. So you can get funding for that. But it's harder to get funding for swarming because most social insects don't swarm. And you know, solitary insects obviously don't swarm. And even most social insects don't swarm. And so swarming is sort of a trait that's limited to the highly social bees and some and wasps and, and a handful of ant species. And so it's harder to get funding to, to study swarming, which is why it's sort of under understudied and, and not as well understood as you might expect. The other major pheromone in the nest is the brood pheromone. So the, the brood also produces a, a complex pheromone. It's about a dozen compounds and it seems to be two separate signals. There's one signal that's very volatile and one signal that's not so volatile, but they have overlapping functions and it's not exactly clear which, which of them does what. What is clear is that the, what, what the signal is for. And so the signal, the larva is signaling its hunger to the nurses and it's also signaling to the foragers that they should collect more pollen. So this is one of these signals that has more than one meaning depending on who's receiving the signal. So the same signal to a nurse means feed this larva, it's hungry. The set, that same signal means to a forager, go out and get more pollen because the, you know, the larva are hungry now or are going to be hungry soon. So Tanya Pankew um, has done a bunch of, did a bunch of studies on this, whereby you can extract the brood pheromone the same way you, you, know, you extract other pheromones with a solvent from the surface of the, the insect. And then you basically can add a bunch of brood pheromone to the nest. And when you do that, you find that it increases the rate of pollen foraging in the nest. So as I was saying, the, the brood pheromone means two things. It means you know, feed me to the nurses and it means go out and collect more pollen to the foragers. And so the more brood you have, the more pollen you get that gets collected because there's more of the signal. And then the fewer, the, the, the smaller the amount of brood, the less of this brood pheromone signal that gets produced and, and that contributes to a lower level of pollen foraging. So the workers also have lots of um, pheromones. We talked about the queen pheromones and the, the brood pheromones. Drones also have some pheromones, but I'm not gonna talk about them. The worker ones are the, the other big body of them. They have defensive ones, foraging ones. They have ones that are important for division of labor. So this one, ethyl oleate, is produced in the crops of foragers. And it seems to be a signal that is transferred to the hive bees via trophallaxis, the sharing of food. And we think it helps to equilibrate the ratio of bees that are foragers versus nurses versus middle-aged bees. And so there has to be an optimal ratio of foragers to middle-aged bees to nurses. And we think that this signal of the foragers is basically telling the colony what percentage of the colony is currently composed of foragers. And that, 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 that fraction varies a lot through the year. So we, we think it basically you know, increases or decreases the rate of development. If there's, if there's more of this signal being produced, it slows the rate of development, basically causes fewer bees to transition into the foraging cast. If there's less of it, then the, that means the foragers are dying and then the middle-aged bees become foragers quicker. It's kind of speculative. There's not, there hasn't been a lot of work on this signal, but from what we have done, that's, that's essentially what we think it does. The alarm pheromone is the, the easiest one to understand. It, it's, you know, the, when the worker bee stings you, you know, the, um, they, the, the, the venom sac and also the little ganglia, the little mini brain is there the, to control the activities of it. And basically it keeps pumping, but the, but it also releases this pheromone, this alarm pheromone, which marks you and then the other bees sting you. It's actually a little more complicated than that. So it turns out that the alarm pheromone is actually two pheromones. There's, there's this isopentyl acetate, which is the famous one. That's actually a sort of a long distance attractant. And then there's another, pher there's another pheromone that works closer, which is sort of the homing beacon one called eicosanol. And it's also the case that the, 
what we think we think the way the the alarm pheromone works is that it doesn't so much cause a bee to sting you as it sort of heightens their sense of it, it sort of heightens their stress level and heightens their sense of activity it sort of um energizes and activates them because they'll sting you with or without the alarm pheromone as every beekeeper knows and so a lot of it is visual there's so there's a there's a olfactory component which is this pheromone is the visual component and then the alarm pheromone seems to activate them and sort of you know hype them up and get them ready for action sort of put them into a state a physiological nervous sort of state where they're really likely to sting. That seems to be more what it does than actually allowing them to find you because it seems like they find you more visually than they do with the, with the old factory part. <clears throat> but sort of what I'm getting at there is that everything in biology is always more complicated than it seems at first, the more you dig into it. Like you might think there's one simple pheromone that does something simple, but then the more you look at it, you notice there's actually two pheromones that have that, and that one function is actually broken up into two functions. And there's actually, you know, the visions involved as well. And also, you know, you know, a bunch of other stuff. So anyway, this, 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 when you do the extraction of all the compounds that are in this gland that's producing the alarm pheromone, there's actually 24 different compounds in there. And so the, a lot of it is this famous one that smells like bananas, but it doesn't work by itself. So it's kind of like the QMP story. If you do a bunch of experiments with isopentyl acetate, trying to you know, elicit aggression in bees compared to the whole extraction with the 24 compounds, the 24 compounds elicits much more aggression than does the isopentyl acetate alone. But of, of all of the compounds, the isopentyl acetate is the strongest one. So it works in conjunction with other compounds, but exactly how we don't really understand. The Nazanoff pheromones of, is a really interesting and cool one. Here's some pictures of bees that are releasing it. It's it when it's it's uh, the gland is just beneath the tergite here. It's a it's a sort of um, you probably have seen it in your in your in your colonies. And so it's essentially a homing beacon. So they 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 expose this gland to the air and they fan their wings and it you know puffs out the the pheromone in a in sort of a well, it, it diffuses away from the where the bees are starting. And then other bees can use that as a homing beacon to find where these bees are. So it's usually a, a good context to do it is if you get a bunch of bees from your hive, like the, uh, the, um, the brood zone, for example, bees that have not started foraging and haven't been outside before, and you knock them out in front of the hive and they find their way back in. Before they actually walk in, they'll stop and do this and do the Nazanoff gland release as sort of a, a homing beacon to help the other bees find their way home. They do it in swarming as well. So when they find a new place to live, for example, the scouts are basically there and the swarm is being guided there by the other scouts. The scouts that are in the new, the new nest, they're releasing lots and lots of this Nazanoff gland pheromone to guide the swarm to the, the new home. These also have a flower signal that of all of these different signals, it's interesting that this one is not well understood in honeybees. Usually in, it's the case that we know how things work in honeybees, but not in bumblebees or not in you know, leafcutter bees or all the different other kinds of bees out there. But this is one of the few cases where we know how it works in almost all the other bees, but we don't know how it works in honeybees. But we know honeybees can do the same thing. And so essentially what I'm getting at is that when a bee visits a flower, she basically depletes that flower. She can deplete that flower of all of the nectar that it has. And so a bee that would arrive at that flower immediately afterwards is gonna find an empty flower, right? And so it makes sense to mark that flower with a pheromone so that when the bee is flying up to it, she smells the pheromone, basically infers that this flower was just visited by another forager and just skips that flower and goes to another one. And so it turns out that all bees have these flower marking signals and they can read them across species. And so bumblebees have them, solitary bees have them, honeybees have them. Every bee that visits a flower leaves a signal there, a pheromone signal there, basically telling the next visitor how long ago it was that they were there. So it turns out depleted flowers are ignored for about an hour. That's usually about how long it takes the plant to replenish the nectar in the flower. So this is just a simple experiment where you, you you have the bee visit a flower and then you record what percentage of the, 
the time that flower is rejected by the next bee that comes in over you know, a period of time. And after about an hour, they get back to the baseline levels of accepting that flower. So for most bees, this, this pheromone is produced by the tarsal glands. That's the foot, those are the foot glands. And it makes sense, you know, as they're running around in the flower, they're leaving these foot marks that are smelly. And then the next bee can smell those. And, and if, they're, if the smell is fresh, they know a bee was just there. There's probably no food they can fly on. And honeybees, it's not the tarsal glands that produce this pheromone, but we don't actually know which, I mean, we can do the behavioral experiments to know that they actually, they're leaving something because the bees are avoiding that flower afterwards. But exactly what the chemical is, we don't know. But the little bit that we have we know that it might be this, this compound called 2-heptanone from the mandibular glands, which, which also might make sense because when they're, when they're, you know, when they're getting either nectar or pollen, they're using their mandibles a lot and their truffle and their um, proboscis to, to drink and manipulate the flower. And so this mandibular gland releases its components onto the mandibles and also the proboscis is involved. And so that would be another way, but the data aren't, aren't terribly clear. And so it's not, it's not, it's clear that the honeybee has this signal, but exactly what the chemical is. isn't. So that's sort of what I have that I sort of covered the ones that we have a reasonable understanding of, of what the function is, but some of these other glands, we don't actually know what they do. The, the dufers gland is, you know, the, the main one that is really, really poorly understood. This gland up here in the head, this part of the, the salivary gland is also not understood what it does. This gland here, the thoracic salivary gland I didn't talk about, it makes the, the hydrocarbons for nest mate recognition. And then that, this big, the biggest gland is the hypopharyngeal gland, this big gland here, and it makes brood food. It's where the royal jelly is, is produced by. <clears throat> so that's kind of um, what I have. Do, are there questions about either any of this stuff or something having to do with communication or division of labor or colony organization or cohesion, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I, I was gonna ask a question about um, aging queens and uh, whether there's been studies to show that uh, the queen pheromones decrease in, in strength or production in queens as they get older as a potential signal that uh, they may need to swarm. Yeah, so that's that's how we think it works. It hasn't been studied as much as you would as you would think. The the clear paper, well, it's not clear, but the only good paper is by um, Butler from the 1950s. I'm sure it's available on Google Scholar. Um, but he, they showed that aging queens are more likely to be superseded. And we think that it, the, it's, the, it's the fertility signal that wanes as they get older and it falls below some threshold and that causes the bees to begin the, the, the supersedure process. And we know that that's how it works in ants. And so in some ants, it's been, what I just said has been sort of tested with a lot of rigor and that is how it works. And so given that all the, the components are in place for honeybees, we're pretty sure that that's how it works for honeybees as well. But it's hard to sort of tell what the fertility signal is in honeybees. It, it, it's, not, it's not QMP. The QMP signal seems to be the signal that suppresses the workers' ovaries and elicits the retinue but it doesn't seem to be that, it doesn't seem to control supersedure. And so that seems to be a separate fertility signal. And there's a separate gland, maybe the, it's called the labial gland that might be in doing that, but it hasn't been definitively shown. We kind of wait until we have the umpteenth proof to, to say that, you know, we, that that's how it works in science, but- Oh, sure. I think that, I think that what you said is, is, is true. The aging queen produces a smaller fertility signal. The workers use that to replace her. Okay. I actually have another question related to the identifying hive mates signal. Um, so, so sort of a common practice, um, as far as I'm aware, is to, you know, you could donate a frame of brood from one hive to another hive. And so it would seem that this signal is not necessarily heritable because those bees that are then raised in that second hive would have uh, different genetic components than the hive they're introduced into. So is there any work on how their different um, hive identifying molecules are 
I guess, inherited or produced um, within a particular hive? So there's sort of two parts to that. The, the first part has to do with emerging, emerging brood and why they don't get attacked if you move you know, a frame from one colony to the next. It turns out that the emerging, when the bees first emerge, they're not producing these signals. They sort of start out as a blank slate. So the, 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 it's, their, the biology is such that they wait a few days, their body waits a few days before they start making like these, these labels. And that sort of facilitates them being accepted into the hive, no matter what the current distribution of labels is in that hive. And then the second part of it has to do with um, them making what's called the gestalt sort of signal, which is that every bee has a heritable mix of labels that they produce, but then these are waxy compounds that are on the surface of the bee's body and they brush off of them. So if you watch the colony, they're all on top of each other and walking around. And so they're basically sharing, everybody's sharing their labels with everybody else in the colony such that you get one blended, you know, set of labels that everybody has in the nest. That's why you can sort of cross, that's why you can, if you put a queen in, an, in a cage and put her in there and the bees feed her and they brush up against her, but they can't sting her right away eventually and she'll acquire the odor of the colony because they're transferable. And so there is a, there is a genetic component, but it's superseded by the sharing of the labels by everybody in the nest. That, that's really interesting, thank you. I guess that explains why you can dump house bees into a different hive and they'll be accepted. You can dump the newly emerged bees, but if you, if you dump the nurses and above, you may or may not get fighting because the, the bees are really unpredictable with respect to nestmate recognition and fighting. So in ants, for example, they always fight. In most cases, if you get, like if you were a kid and you played that silly game where you get some ants from across the street and these ants and you put them together and they fight because their nestmate recognition doesn't match up. With bees, they don't always do that. And so it's kind of the, the, the common sense example that you probably see in your hives is that they don't always post guards. And so typically in honeybees, they only post guards during dearths. And then during times of plenty, they don't, they don't post guards and they're not really paying much attention to whether or not the, everybody's supposed to be there. So there can be a lot of drifting at those times of the year. It's only sort of when they're activated, when they're, when they're worried about being robbed, that they sort of turn on this nestmate recognition system. And then, they, and then if they encounter somebody that's not a nestmate, they'll attack them and try to kill them. But for much of the year, if things are good, if times are good and they're collecting food, they might just accept those individuals, even though they're, they're not, you know. They're, so essentially they're, 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 their olfactory system is recognizing them as, as foreign, but the part of the brain that's controlling whether or not to attack or not is not connected. They're, they're, not, they're not attacking. And we just think that, you know, it's not cost effective to focus on defense when there's lots, or robbing when there's lots of food available in the field. And so robbing is really dangerous in honeybees because they, if you've seen robbing, the, the bees sting each other, the corpses pile up in front of the hive, it's a really dangerous way to get food, right? Robbing a honeybee colony if you're another, another bee colony. So they only do it when in, in times of dearth. And so in times of plenty, it's just way more cost effective to just focus on getting working flowers. So that's why you can usually get away with, with doing lots of splits and merges and, and, and cross taking some bees from here and moving them there. But then if you keep doing it, you'll notice that eventually you'll try to add some house bees, for example, and they'll all be killed. So if you do it enough, like with behavioral experiments, we're always trying to add bees that have been marked in some special way or do something like that. And nine times out of 10, you can get away with putting foreign bees into a hive and it's not that big a deal, but when they are ready to go, they'll, they'll fight like crazy and, and they'll kill all your introduced bees. I have a, <clears throat> just a comment. My mentor, uh, when combining two different colonies and needs to be set up right away, will leave the frames of bees out of the hive on the frames in the light for a while. And then when putting them back together, they don't seem to fight either after being exposed to light. Have you heard of that before? Um, no, I haven't heard of that, but there's sort of lots of things like that, that for which you need an experiment with a control to know if it, if it works. Like somebody might've done that and it worked but if you didn't have an experiment with a control, 
to, to see that it was actually the light that was the, you know, the important thing. Like maybe they were just accepting everybody at that point, like I said. And so you'd have to sort of, you know, set up the experiment such that you could narrow it down to, to the effect that you think is causing it. The field bees probably leave those frames and the field bees are less um, acceptable when they visit another hive. I'm, I'm trying to get around this part where um, you can dump uh, house bees in a hive, but not field bees. I don't think that's the, I don't think that's the thing. Like, so, but, but there is the difference between the foragers and the within nest bees is that the, the foragers mm -hmm. are much more likely to do the attacking. And so if you watch colonies that are being robbed out, when they're, when the robbing out is finished, there's usually the nurses and the queen are still in there and the nurses are kind of cowering in the corner. And so the fighting is usually done by the foragers. But in terms of like being accepted or rejected, I think that's the same whether you're a, a forager or a or a, a hive bee. Fascinating. But I think you can get away with just adding them because usually honeybees aren't, aren't, you know, they're not, they're not being defensive. They're not, they're not rejecting foreigners essentially most of the time, which is why you can have so much drifting. Like if you put your hives and your hive stand facing in the same direction, you notice that the ones on the edge. They get they get the most of the drifting and they they can be stronger than the ones in the middle. And there's just a lot of drifting in apiaries, and that that wouldn't be possible if bees were really stringent about rejecting all you know foreign nest mates. They basically only do it sometimes of the year when they get going. Like if you if you've done a lot of like beekeeping and you've seen them when they get to robbing, their behavior is just totally different. The whole running board is full of guards. They they frisk every single bee that comes in. There's constant fighting. They're constant. They, the a bee that's a forager that's coming in will be checked like like ten times before she can get in the in the entrance. Like ten different bees rush up and grab her and smell her and make, and make sure that she's supposed to be there. And so, but they don't usually do that. You know, typically they're not they're not trying to keep you know other bees out. And so bees drifting and you know they don't they don't they're not they're not too bothered. They also seem to have a threshold. And so if you look if you read that. That paper by Butler that I mentioned, this is a different paper, but Butler also did the paper on the classic work on robbing. It's also from the 1950s. And so he showed that if you, he did an experiment where he introduced young bees in groups of 10 at the entrance to a foreign hive. And he found that for the first hundred or so, they don't care, but past some threshold of bees, they activate and they start to post guards and they start to attack and maul the bees that are in, being introduced. And so there could be some pheromonal thing such that a certain you know quantity of label in the environment sort of triggers them. But so what I'm saying is that they they're not terribly sensitive to a small number, but a bigger a bigger number will sort of trigger them. It's also not as well understood as we would like. So the work that's really clear in nestmate recognition is on ants, and it's because, like I said, they always fight. And so whenever you put ants from different colonies together, they almost always fight immediately. And you get a nice, clear response every time you do the experiment. But honeybees don't usually fight. And so it's harder to get that, it's harder to do experiments where you can get them to show whether or not they're recognizing that this individual is foreign or not. Because they could be recognizing that it's not from their colony, they're just not attacking because that part of the response is not you know, turned on at that moment. Yeah, what about, uh, you, men you mentioned, but you said you were going to skip drone pheromones. Oh, um, I think the, the um, drones have a pheromone that is attractive to other drones. And they also have a pheromone that's attractive to queens. I think there's a pheromone that drones produce that helps the queens find the drone congregation areas. But neither of them are, rec are, are understood in terms of what the chemical is and what gland is producing it. There's just behavioral experiments showing that, you know, they're basically usually Y experiments where you have like a tube that's like a Y like this and the drone is here and you push air out and then you see which direction the, or the, the drone is in the, you have a Y tube like this and the drone is here and there's nothing over here and there's airflow and, you, and then you release a drone and you see which direction they go. They're attracted to other drones. And so it seems as though the drones have some chemical signal that attracts other drones. They also have a signal that attracts queens, but, um, but what they are, nobody knows. And in, in general, you know, there's very little work on drones. 
because they don't, they're not social. They, they don't sort of do the cool stuff that the bee scientists find interesting about bees. Maybe one exception to that and one reason drones should be better studied is that I think, and other people are starting to think that they might be good vectors of diseases and, and varroa mites because drones drift even more than workers do. And they're carrying the mites in their bodies. They could also be carrying other pathogens. And so they could be sort of really efficient vectors of disease, especially in apiaries, because an apiary is a very unnatural situation. In nature, honeybee colonies are very, very, you know, thinly dispersed. There, there's sort of one per acre, or one per five acres, something like that. And so one of the reasons they drift so much is that they don't have an evolutionary history of being really precise about entering colony A versus colony B when they're right by each other. In nature, they're never right by each other. And so they don't, have, they don't have to worry about being that sensitive when they're flying home to their tree cavity. And so they drift a lot. And drones are way worse than, than workers are. And so it could be the case that drones sort of are the vectors for varroa and lots of other pathogens. Drones can expect to get fed in any colony they go into? Pretty much. They don't seem to like, you know, they're not, they don't seem to be part of the, the nest mate recognition thing as much as the, the workers are. Or they they're have sort a pass of, key. Hmm? Or they have a pass key. Yeah. Nobody really knows how it, how it works because nobody studied it, but they, they drift a lot. They're accepted. So, and yeah, they're just, they seem to just be, be accepted wherever they go until the, until the end of the season when it's time to slaughter them all. But until that point, they're kind of accepted wherever they go. It could just be one of these things where there's no, so evolution tends to craft, you know, solutions to problems that exist in nature, you know, over time. But if it's a novel problem, there's no evolutionary history associated with it. And there's no sort of evolved response to it. And so crowding colonies together in an apiary is a very unnatural situation from an evolutionary perspective. And so it could be the case that they just haven't evolved the ability to exclude drones because it doesn't come up in nature so much. Well, drones won't be robbing a colony, so there really isn't a reason to necessarily keep them out. They only just eat. Yeah, I mean, they could be a big drag on resources. I mean, they, you know, they're big and they, they you know, they fly out a couple times a day and It'd be good to, it'd be better, you imagine, to keep them out, but I, I suspect that they just haven't, they don't have an evolutionary history of, of having to respond to that. Either they're all let in or they're all tossed out when, when the season ends. Yeah, I think there's actually a lot of things that happen in apiaries that are sort of caused by crowding bees together. Like I think there's a lot of turnover, there's a lot of cleanless nests. And I, I've, always, I've often thought that the, the frequency of queenlessness has a lot to do with virgin queens come, or mated queens coming back and flying into the wrong nest they, because they drift as well. So in nature, that doesn't happen. So they're, they're in their tree cavity. There's no colony within you know, a mile of them. They don't have to worry about flying into the wrong nest when the queen comes back from her mating flight. But in an apiary, when you have 20 colonies in there and you have a bunch in the same row and they're all facing the same direction, I imagine it happens quite often that a mated queen flies back and flies into the wrong nest and then gets killed by the workers in, in that colony. So, you know, and the take home message being that it's good to sort of do the, what people always suggest, like color your <coughs> colony separately or put some, you know, some, some flower pattern or something on the front of the hive that differs from one hive to the other or face them in different directions on your hive stands to make it better so that make it make it easier for the bees to know you know that they're flying into their colony and not a different one that's sort of especially important for preventing you know the, the problem where you have a strong colony and a weak colony on the same hive stand sometimes that's caused by drifting there's like a predictable bias of bees making the mistake over and over again and flying into the the left or the right hive for reasons we don't understand but but they do that and then they all you know pile up in one, the other one's weaker. Well, they say that they can count to four or maybe three. Yeah, those experiments aren't terribly convincing. No. Mm. But because it's hard to say if, they, if they're measuring sort of the, the quantity of information that flows across their retina or an actual number. 
the neuroethology people that study that argue incessantly about it. And like half of them love it and believe it and the other half don't. It seems kind of hard to believe because it's hard to know, it's hard to understand why they would need to count. But they could, I mean, they, 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 they do have, yeah, it's like 50-50. Like of the people that I know, half the people like those experiments and the other half don't. And so it's not, it's, it's not yet worked out. So plenty of distinctive uh, landmarks around the, the apiary, around the yard, and space the colonies far apart. Yeah. If you can. Tough for an urban environment, though. I mean, the urban environment is, I think, you know, in many ways, one of the best environments to keep bees, though, because there's all these ornamentals that are flowering year round. And when you're in sort of a more wilderness or agricultural area, there's a phenology to the season such that the dearths and the nectar flows are much more, you know, concrete. And especially here in the Central Valley, you know, like it's really hard to, to keep bees strong and healthy out here. And I think the all the all the city bees do better than the bees that are in the agricultural sort of areas. I think it's easier to keep. Like you have to be, you have to be a, a more strict, you know, beekeeper in a harsher environment. You can still be really successful with your bees. You can't, you just can't be as as flexible and you can't play it by year as much as you can in a place where there's forage year round because ornamentals aren't following the the phenology of the local landscape, they can be blooming at any time of the year. And so there's always something in bloom in a city. Whereas if you're in a natural landscape, like, you know, what, there's, there's sort of strict periods of nectar flows, which means you have to time everything just right and make sure you don't take too much from them and they'll starve and all that kind of stuff. Something that the native bees are attuned to, but um, honeybees being the generalists that they are, being the invasive species here are not in sync with. Yeah, most highly, so most social bees are, are generalists. And then the solitary ones, like you say, are, are in tune with the, with the flowers and the, the plants that they, that they specialize on. Like bumblebees are native and they're also generalists. But yeah, North America doesn't have any um, large colony um, bees that are perennials. Which is why we're so dependent on the honeybee for pollination, you know, because there's no there's no other native bee that could that could easily take their place. So we could take like another apis species like serrano or maybe you know a stingless bee or something like that, but then they're also invasive. And so we're kind of stuck with the honeybee as our managed pollinator because their biology you know suits it, and and none of the native bees do. This might be a little bit of a random question, but do you know if any of the indigenous native people in California had relationships to the native bees and collected any sweetness from them? Not that I've ever heard of. I mean, in the in Central America, Mayans and Aztecs kept uh, Melipona, which is the, the largest of the stingless bees, um, and Trigona as well. So they, you can keep, they kept stingless bees and produced honey from them. Um, a stingless bee nest has, it's sort of like a half honeybee, half bumblebee nest. They have comb that looks like honeybee comb for rearing larva, but then they have food pots for storing the, the honey. And so it's harder to do melopona culture because you have to have, you have to empty out all of these little pots as opposed to, you know, using the centri centripetal force to spin out the, the honey from the, or, or, or press it out. And the stingless bees also don't make as much of it. It's also kind of a more it's not as sweet as honeybee honey. It's more like, I think the indigenous people, as far as I know, like to use it as a medicine more than a food stuff. Mm -hmm. And so they, they kept stingless bees, but then most of the honey was used in, in rituals and in, in, in medicine. And I think, you know, honey was used in the West in med as medicine as well, like as to, to, to put on wounds, to, to keep out bacteria. It doesn't allow bacterial growth. The same reason that it doesn't allow bacterial growth in the nest if there's not enough, you know, um, water content. Thanks. Stingless bee honey, incidentally, is um, not as um, is not as thick either as um, honey as Apis mellifera honey. It has more propolis, which is why I think it has like a, a, a medicinal sort of aspect to it. Like it's it's more watery, and I think that's because they there's I think they they prevent bacterial growth by having more propolis 
in it than, than just you know, decreasing the water content like, like Apis mellifera does. But they're really cool and, and they're really cool nests and they're cool, they're cool bees. They're not as well studied as they should be because they're all tropical, uh, the stingless bees. There's, and the infrastructure of science is you know, localized in the temperate zone in the wealthy countries and, and not so much in, the, in Latin America and Central and, Latin, and South America where these bees are. Well, a few years ago, you uh, did a program on the um, uh, testing for genes of um, Africanized bees around the Bay Area, north of San Luis Obispo. I wonder if there's uh, been any further um, sampling taken since uh, that program was done? No, not by me. More work has been done using various genomics tools on Africanized bees versus um, um, European bees. Sort of lots of cross sections from Brazil up to up to here, but but no more sort of sampling of, of exactly where in the state the Africanized bees are. Myself, I've been sort of writing a book. I wrote a, a honeybee biology book to, to to take the place of the old Winston book, which is a great book, but it's you know thirty years old, and so it's out of date on a lot of topics. And so the last two three years, I've been writing that. I just finished it. But I would like to go back and, and do the Africanized bee again in more detail and also do some behavioral stuff with them to see if they're as aggressive, you know, at the limit of their distribution as they are, you know, more deep within it. But not fun bees to work with. I don't know if you've like, you know, worked with Africanized bees before, but but they they really suck, like almost as much as as people say they do. Like, like if you lift, there's one little strip. Where your, your where your suit pulls away from your you know if you're wearing gloves there's like a little strip of skin you can have that whole strip of skin black with stingers like within a minute and it's just a, it's just and when you have them all like you know all over like trying to to kill you basically all the time it's just a pain in the butt and you got to like park far away and put the suit on and then walk over there and tape everything like tape your your ankles and all of that stuff and it's just not enjoyable and they're also they also run around a lot so with a european bee you can pick up the frame you know and like look at them and they kind of just stand there like cows like they're not even paying attention africanized bees aren't like that and and tropical bees in general aren't like that when you pick up the frame and you manipulate it and move around they'll look they'll look back at you they they're more likely to explode off of the frame and attack you from there they're they're not just they're not just ignoring what you're doing they're they're very much aware of you and if you have and if you harass them a lot they abscond much more than european bees do but having said all of that you know the the initial plan for africanized bees did work out because they they are much better in the tropics than european bees were like the the beekeepers in brazil and places like that are 10 times as economically productive with the Africanized bees as they were with European bees. How do they do with varroa mites? They don't have a problem with varroa mites. That's another, the other nice thing about Africanized bees that you don't have to treat them for varroa mites. The mites don't do as well on them. There's like three different reasons why the mites don't do well on the Africanized bees. One, the, the Africanized bees are much better at grooming off of off the mites they're better at grooming each other with hygienic behavior. They're also better at the pulling out the disease larva and getting rid of them. And then it's also the case that the, the mites just don't grow as well on Africanized larva as they do on European larva. And it's not exactly clear why. People have just done the experiments where you in the same nest, you have European larva and Africanized larva, and you put the same quantity of mites in each cell, and then you measure the survivorship of the mites in the different cells and the mites just don't survive as well in the Africanized bee, on the Africanized bee larva. I mean, eventually if, I mean, you could, I mean, who knows what's, what's eventually gonna happen with Varroa, but the, the European bee can also evolve resistance. Like there's, there, there are those studies in Sweden. I don't know if you guys are familiar with them. There's, um, I think the place is called Gotland. There's a long-term experiment where they just let a bunch of, you know, colonies, fend for themselves on this little island off the coast of Sweden. And what you find is that for the first five, seven years or so, there's very, very high mortality of the colonies. And some, but, but some colonies do survive. They kind of just peter along at very low population levels. And then they, then they essentially evolve 
resistance to the mites, and then the population comes back. It's also been shown that in the, the feral bees in the United States have also recovered from varroa mites. It's really only the managed colonies that we keep that have, you know, or that are still really, really susceptible to the varroa mite. Probably because we don't let natural selection take its course. You know, we treat, we treat them and we create this artificial situation where the mites are having this bonanza of bees at very high density and it's easy for them to spread. And whereas in nature, there aren't so many, the colonies are not crowded together and they, there's, there's selection for, you know, um, decreased virulence on the part of the mites and also resistance on the part of the bees. So is there advice to us to be derived from that information, do you think? Tom Seeley is writing a book called Darwinian Beekeeping. So he's shown that the, 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 um, the, fer the wild bees, the feral bees, the feral European bees in upstate New York that survive with Varroa without treatment, they, they have, they're smaller in size and they swarm much more often. And so if you just sort of keep your bees in a way that's more natural, so the, we, we suppress swarming, for example, right? I heard you guys talking about that and we like the colonies to be really big because they produce a lot more honey when they're, when they're big. Whereas, you know, the, the bees in nature tend to live in smaller cavities than the, the, the boxes that we give, they swarm much more often. And so if you keep the colony smaller and you let them swarm naturally more often, they probably have less problems with varroa mites. You wouldn't make as much honey. And so it's sort of a trade-off, you know, you can sort of keep the bees, the bees can, you know, take care of themselves, but they won't make you much honey or you can treat for varroa mites and you know, make a lot of honey. And so it's sort of there, there's the trade off there. I don't think Tom's book is out yet, but I think he's written some, some articles for the beekeeping press about, about his Darwinian beekeeping idea. And I know he has, has it in mind to, to write that book. His last chapter in uh, his previous book, The Lives of Bees discusses Darwinian beekeeping. Yeah, I'm reading that right now. I, I like that book. He was my advisor in grad school, so I, I, I know him really well. And he was nice enough to read the, the honeybee biology book that, that I, um, I just wrote and gave comments and stuff. When will that be available? Not for an, a year. So it works and it moves at a glacial pace. And so I turned in the book a few weeks ago and it's all done. It went through peer review and all that kind of stuff. And so once it's completely done, there's still another year of waiting before the press puts it out. It's kind of annoying, you know, you finish something and you're, you're hoping that it comes out, but I guess they have like copy editors and like all kinds of people that are involved in making the cover and putting a picture there and like, and they're, they're producing tons of other books and your book goes into the queue and, and gets into the assembly line and eventually it comes out. But it's kind of, it, you know, it's an update to the, to the Winston book, which is really good. But I also covered some things that Winston didn't cover. I covered neurobiology and, and neuroethology, which are really long fields of study in honeybees and um, some other things as well. Obviously there wasn't genomics and stuff like that when, 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 when he wrote that book. Is the Winston book still worth reading? I have it on my shelf, but I was concerned about the outdatedness of it. Well, all of the natural history stuff is still, you know, natural history, that stuff doesn't, doesn't change. And so, I, I think it's still worth reading. And also even the new book, there are definitely things that I don't cover as well as Winston covers. Like there's lots of really, really descriptive things that I just didn't have space for, but the, those descriptions are very useful. And so I think it's, it's, it's best to have both of the books, the updated one and also the Winston one. It's also the case that some topics are not popular right now, but they're still important topics and they were popular in, in, in the time when he wrote that book. And so I tended to steer towards the things that are topical right now, but you should still know all those things that were topical, you know, 30 years ago. They're still really interesting biology. Do you think there's any aspect of um, the kind of beekeeping we're doing that is underappreciated by us or not talked about enough or something we should focus on that our meetings might not normally think about? I'm not sure. I think there's some things that as a behaviorist, I'm always skeptical about, like when I, when I read like beekeeping magazines, like things like feeding stimulants, for example, like I don't, I don't know what those could possibly be for. Like the honeybee 
collects the maximum amount of nectar they can possibly collect. Like their entire life history is organized around collecting as much honey as possible to survive the winter because they're the only insects that are active all year during the winter in a cold climate. And so they're, they're trying to collect the maximum amount of, they're trying to make the most honey they possibly can. So the idea of giving them a feeding stimulant when they're already going at their maximum, I think what you would do is just overstress them. You would get them to, to work harder than they naturally would, and they probably would die faster and actually be counterproductive. And so that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And another one that people don't like to hear, but I'm always skeptical when people say that the bees need to be watered. Because I wonder like who's watering the zillions of bugs in my yard? You know, like, I mean, the reason you have to water your dog and things like that, because they can't get out of your yard, right? I mean, they, but if you, if your dog could run free, like all, every animal is able to find water. They're all really, really good at finding water. And like my yard literally has 4 billion insects out there and they all get water just fine. And so the honeybee is able to get water, no problem. Like you don't really have to give them water. Like, but the one context in which you, it, it is, can, it can be good is that if you have a lot of colonies and your neighbor has a pool or something like that, your bees can be a nuisance. So if you're, if you're watering them to stop them from being a nuisance of your neighbors, which I heard somebody saying before, that's perfectly valid. But the idea that if you don't water them, they're gonna starve or they're gonna die of thirst is ridiculous. They're not gonna die of thirst. They have a flight radius of like 12 kilometers in every direction. And they're extremely good at finding water just like every other you know, insect in nature is. And so they don't, they don't really need that. Another, another thing is like the, the pollen supplements. I think those are, that's another thing where the marketing is, I think people are selling that stuff and people are buying it when they don't need it. it it's really rare that honeybees can't get pollen. They can, it's, it's nectar that's usually in, in short supply and you can get it or you can't, but, there's, but bees will collect pollen from tons and tons of flowers, even things that are wind pollinated they'll still collect that pollen. They don't like to because it's harder to collect. It's not as sticky. It's not as nutritious maybe, but in a pinch, they'll go out and get it. And so usually when people will see, they'll go into their colonies and they'll see that they're not collecting much pollen. They don't have a lot of pollen. They'll think, oh, I need to give them pollen. But it could just be that they're not rearing a lot of young, they're not rearing a lot of larvae right then. You know, so they, 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 don't, they only collect as much pollen as they need, but they collect as much nectar as they can get. So they're always trying to collect as much nectar as possible but they know how much pollen they need and they collect just that much. And so if they're not collecting a lot of pollen, it's often because they don't need more pollen right then. And so a really easy way to, to do an experiment to see if your bees actually can't get pollen is to just get some open brood from another nest and of another colony and put it into the, a, a, a focal colony, basically give them a huge amount of brood to feed and take away their pollen frames. And when you do that experiment, you see that the bees the next morning will be trucking in just an amazing amount of pollen. Like in, a, in an environment where you thought there was no pollen, there's tons and tons of pollen. They just weren't getting it because they didn't need it. But in some cases, I mean, so, so what I, when I'm, when I'm, I guess the take home message of what I was just saying is that I think the pollen supplement makes sense for commercial beekeepers because they have gigantic numbers of colonies in one apiary. And so in that context, they can deplete the environment of, of pollen. And a lot of beekeeping journals, a lot of beekeeping supplies and techniques and stuff are sort of geared towards commercial beekeepers. Like if you have hundreds or thousands and thousands of colonies and each of your apiaries is over a hundred and they're completely depleting the environment, they're crowded together, then you, then you have to have these really aggressive feeding strategies and so forth. Whereas if you're a hobbyist beekeeper and you have a handful of colonies in your backyard, the likelihood that they can't get pollen or that they need to be fed or stimulated in all these kinds of ways is very, very, very low. Do you well, make bee. a distinction between uh, pollen substitute and protein substitute? Uh, or, or, you know, uh, pollen patties are different than that. Some of them don't even have pollen in them. They're just if protein. We, if it's, if it's, if you're talking just about nutrition, then, then, yeah, the, the, the pollen substitute is not as nutritious as, as you know, pollen that you've collected yourself with a, with a pollen trap. But I just mean that the idea of, of, of feeding them supplemental pollen, like in a big patty on the top, no matter its source. It's also the case that I think that if you feed them that pollen substitute, 
at a time when they can get their own pollen, you're actually doing them a disservice because you're feeding them a less nutritious alternative that might suppress them from going out and collecting wild pollen that they can get themselves. And also not as sensitive to starvation from pollen as people think they are. Like they can rear two rears. The nurses can rear two rounds of brood just with the resources in their bodies. And so the idea that the colony is out of pollen right now, they're going to starve or they can't rear more larvae, that's not the case. But if that was the case, they couldn't start brood rearing in the middle of winter and, and, get, the, and, get, and get that going. There's no pollen in the nest in the, in, when they start rearing brood in, at, the, at the end of winter. So they're, they're pretty much... They, hmm? Or when a swarm comes in uh, immediately uh, into a, a, an empty hive, there's no pollen in there. They, uh, the queen's laying eggs right away, whereas uh, their protein source, it's coming from the, the uh, bees that, that uh, was, were part of the swarm. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the nurses, the nurses have a lot of protein in their bodies. Something that's interesting is that we store carbohydrates and fats in our bodies. We don't store much protein, um, but insects store all three. They store large quantities of carbohydrate, fat, and protein in their body. So the nurses have a lot of protein in their hemolymph and their in their blood, and and they can they can rear, they can produce brood food for a very long time, even when they're not getting access to 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 bee bread. But I mean, so it, it, so what I'm what I'm getting at is that I'm not trying to say that it's never the case that they need they need supplemental protein feeding. I just think that they don't need it as much as people think they do. There are many cases where people automatically are are laying on a pollen patty to feed them at a time when they're perfectly capable of of getting pollen, and they don't actually need any pollen at all. So oftentimes they don't even eat that patty. And people wonder why in many cases they don't need that. The reason they don't they didn't have much is that they didn't need they didn't need more at that point. When commercial beekeepers are feeding pollen in November and December, I gather they're trying to build up the population so that they have the hives to take to the almond pollination. Uh, but the average backyard beekeeper doesn't really need to do that. Yeah, exactly. I think that's the main the main function of the the pollen substitute. Like, if you want to get the colony big at a time when it's not naturally big, like you know, really strong for for almond pollination early in the year, <clears throat> then you would use then you might use that. But for for hobbyists or people that are not doing you know almond pollination, it's not as it it, it doesn't it, it's it's not as necessary. I know when I was a grad student, for example, I never once fed any of my colonies pollen substitute for that whole five-year period, and I never had any problem at all. I can't get our technician here to stop to stop feeding them the pollen substitute. He's like, you know, there's a ton of people who think there. I think there's sort of a lot of people who think that you have to mollycoddle the bees to an amazing extent. Like you have to feed them everything and give them this and give them this and give them. And, you know, some cases, yes, in some cases, no. It's definitely way harder to do beekeeping now than it was in the past. But I think most of that is a function of the Varroa mite. Like before the Varroa mite was bad, like when I started beekeeping like 20 years ago, <clears throat> the apistan strips were still working really, really well. They worked perfectly. You would treat once with apistan and that was it. And they would knock the mites down for the whole year. And then one person, you know, commercial commercial people, like one person could could keep, you know, 500 to 1,000 colonies. Because you have to do the, the row, you have to do the, you know, the mite checks, you have to do any of that stuff. Like you just, you just put them someplace, they take care of themselves, and then you move them someplace else. And then at some point you go and extract, and maybe you get some seasonal labor for that time period. But, you know, one person used to be able to manage 10 times as many colonies as now. But I think most of that's because of the varroa mites, not because the bees need, you know, endless sort of, you know, feeding and medicating and, 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 and so forth. I'm making insulated lay-ins hives on the theory that if they spend less time or less energy, um, like climate controlling the inside of the hive, they can have more energy to take care of mites or something else, but I'm still pretty new at this. I wonder if you think there's any validity to that idea. 
Tom Seeley did some experiments on that lives of bees that he, he, he recounts in the lives of bees. And at least in a very cold climate, it's definitely better in the tree cavity with like a, a really thick, you know, wooden wall. They thermoregulate much better. And they probably have much higher survivorship because they don't, because their main cause of, you know, of death overwintering is starvation. They run out of fuel. And so the more the more thermoregulated the environment is, the the better. But it's hard around here because you know they don't they don't really go into the same the same overwintering process like it's warm enough in the middle of the year that they'll go out and try to forage they might even try to you know rear some young and so it's really hard to it's harder to i think it's harder ironically to overwinter them here than it is some place where it's really cold and then also the benefit wouldn't be as much because they don't if they're still trying to be active and they're not trying to conserve energy it might not be as effective as it would be in you know a cold climate, but in a cold climate, yeah, definitely that would that that's that's a great thing. It's it's harder to say around here. What about in a cold climate like the Pacific Northwest, where it's really moist and it it gets cold, but it's not you know snow staying on the ground for a long time? Would it still be good out there? I mean, I would imagine so. I think it's just a, it, it, the colder it is, the the better it would be. But I think it'd be a continuous thing such that, you know, every increment of colder, the, the more insulated they are, the the less energy they, they would use and the more likely they'd be to survive the, the winter. It seems to be the most key in really cold places. Because they're really good at thermoregulation. Because, I mean, they, they, you know, they survive all day you know, up in Canada and, and Scandinavia and places like that. And so they're really, really good at thermoregulation. And so I think it's it's really like a, a meaningful thing in very cold environments. Yeah. Like I think around here, it's kind of, you know, they're they're really good. They're really good at that kind of stuff. And so I think it's it's less of a it's less of a factor around here. Okay. Our winter is like a, a spring day in the Midwest or the upper Midwest. Yeah. And our, our bees don't make uh, winter bees around here because they're foraging all winter long. They're raising brood all, all year long. Yeah. And then, and, you know, like I was saying, ironically, it makes it harder to, to overwinter them. Because in a really cold climate, like I went to grad school in upstate New York and there, when the winter comes, you forget all about the bees. Like you just get them ready for, for winter and you make sure that they're big enough and they have enough food. <clears throat> some people insulate and some people don't. But then once, whatever it is you do, once you do that, it's over until, until spring. You don't ever go back and worry about them. And, and they shut down completely. They go into the cluster. They're thermoregulating the whole time. They're, you know, they're, and we have really high, you know, well, you know, I think it, it, the, to the extent that they have mortality, it, it's, it's usually associated with the mites more so than, than, the, than the cold or anything like that. I'm thinking about writing maybe another book that's about sort of um, the story of the, the mites in conjunction with CCD and all these things. Because something that's frustrating is that every aspect of the bee crisis has received more funding than the mites. Like, you know, the, the native bees as alternative pollinators, the pesticides, the various pathogens, nosema and viruses and so forth. It seems like everything is cooler and has received more funding than the mite studies. Even though I think most beekeepers think that the mites are far and away the, the major stressor and the major causes of, of losses. And I think it's just a function of what's cool and topical and what's sort of environmental. Like mites are a very straightforward not straightforward, but they're an IPM problem. It's, it's, it's about killing the bugs that we don't want. It's not sort of, you know, it's not saving the environment and it's not, you know, it, it doesn't have the, 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 the sort of coolness that the pesticide stuff does or the, the native pollinator stuff does. And I'm not criticizing that stuff. That's important and interesting, you know, work as well. It's just, you know, I think we have to do the, the mite stuff in addition to that. I'm gonna read the, um the book that you said is coming out about feral bees or Darwinism of bees. That seems really interesting. I'm into it. Um, but do you have any early opinions on the idea of like feral be keeping feral bees alongside your managed bees? Like if in a part of our yard, we just had a log hive that had a colony in it, we never touched it and it did its thing. Does that have any advantage or disadvantage to 
are domesticated bees? I don't really think that bees are domesticated because, you know, our domesticated our bees, I guess, are managed colonies. Yeah. I mean, I think in terms of beekeeping, they're all, they're all really the same. I mean, they, you know, it's really hard to breed bees because you have to artificially select them. It, you know, it, the means to, to, to do the, the artificial insemination is really difficult. And bees, the queen mates with 12 males at random from all over the place. And so the, the, the breeding process is extremely difficult with them. But in general, I think, like I've never been a big fan of like the top bar hives or any of the sort of like natural beekeeping styles. Cause I think the, the Langstroth hive is just made of wood. You know, it's just a convenient way to allow you to take the frames in and out without damaging the, the comb. And so you can do organic beekeeping with the Langstroth hive just as easy as with any other, you know, type of hive. And because if you have colonies in like a, a skep hive, which are just a, a log hive or something like that, and all of the frames are connected to each other, I mean, all the combs are connected to each other. They're also connected to the, 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 the interior of whatever the cavity is. And so to get the honey out, you have to cut it out and it makes a big mess. And you have to squeeze it. You have to squeeze the, the honey out of the frames, which also makes a mess. And it just seems, you know, it's, it, it doesn't, I've never understood the sort of the, the benefit of, of trying to, to beekeep in that way, because it was just, it's just a, a pain in the butt. And the Langstroth hive is so much easier to use than, than those other approaches. Well, I'm thinking about it in terms of the Darwinistic approach to trying to overcome the mites. You know, you mentioned after seven years, the yeah. they're all, colonies were doing better. So I wonder if there's um, anything to just having a feral colony in the corner of your yard that you just never touch and you never you take mean, the home out of. Yeah, so if that was the case, you could put them into a Langstroth hive, just a small one. You could put them into a nuke or a single story hive or something like that. But Yeah, I don't mean to distract you with the with the log hive comment. Yeah. I just mean like- but The problem with doing survivorship bees around here is that if you're in a city, for example, there's lots of bees around, there's other you know, beekeepers around you. And when their colonies die of mites, they're gonna explode in this you know, Varroa bomb with drifting and stuff. And so it's really hard to isolate your bees from all the bees around them. So those, those successful stories of, of doing the, the survivorship bees like in Sweden and the feral bees in the forest and such, they're really isolated from other populations. And so whatever happens there is local. It's not like there's other bees right next door that are, you know, constantly moving in and out and being managed in this and that way and so forth. And so it's hard to do that sort of in a city environment. Like if you're really out in the wilderness, you can do it. Mm -hmm. Some of your neighbors may be bringing in Randy Oliver colonies. Some of them may be bringing in uh, packages from some other commercial beekeeper in some other part of the valley. Uh, people are bringing in. Uh, queens that they find in Hawaii and off of the off of Craigslist. So you've got such a mixture of out of area genetics that it's kind of hard to pull off the trick of isolating and developing, uh, nurturing your own local genetics. Yeah, exactly. So in, in these survivorship situations, you want to have a small isolated population that evolves resistance by changing their genetics to, you know, better allow them to resist the mites. But if there's constant influx of other bees and they're in this environment where they're, you know, the, 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 the virgins are flying out and mating with all the males from around you or, and also just so many mites pouring in from the, the colonies next door. And like, it's really hard. All right, thanks. Yeah, I think we're stuck with, you know, treating for varroa mites. I mean, Otherwise, you just sort of, you know, the colonies die every couple of years and then you buy more packages and start over. I think those are kind of the options for, you know, beekeeping with or without treating for the mites. Well, that's one thing uh, Alameda County beekeepers uh, ceased doing is bringing in packages. So you guys rear your own colonies and then sell to each other? There's some of that. Um, our swarm hotline um, yielded about 300 uh, swarms from around the county in last year uh, that got distributed among a lot of people who chase colonies. Uh, some of our local beekeepers, particularly like Jennifer Berry in Marin County uh, is trying to keep her bees local. 
Um, I think uh, uh, Jim Garcia is also trying to keep his bees more or less local. Yeah, that's awesome. Swarm capture can work really well. You just have to figure out how to do it. Like you have to figure out where to put the boxes and how many of them and what your rate of success is. And But once you work it out, it works really well. And so it's kind of another example of what I was saying before in that a lot of things that are in big beekeeping magazines or sort of, um, or books on beekeeping are sort of geared more towards the commercial people than, sort of the ho than towards the hobbyist. The hobbyist can kind of get away without doing a lot of things that the commercial people do all the time like buying tons and tons of packages every year. The person who does our um, uh, swarm trap program every year, uh, one year he got 16 uh, colonies trapped in his traps uh, in, in Fremont. Uh, the following year it was 16. I think the next year after that was 24, but he said last year wasn't quite as good. But he's not getting Africanized bees in, the, in his swarms? No, I think the Africanized bees are kind of um, Salinas Valley and South. Um, in South America, there, there's not much below 35 degrees South. And I presume that above 35 degrees North, uh, the Africanized bees have a hard time. Yeah, I think we're right at the border of what they can tolerate. And so I, I think they're around here, but at very low frequency. I think part of what brings them into our area is hitchhiking on, on transport of some sort you know, in a load of cargo on a freight car. Yeah, that could happen as well. And, or just, you know, for, for pollination. And then they, then they swarm from the, the almonds and up right. here around Sacramento. Well, I, I gather that uh, there's pretty strong uh, advice not to bring Africanized colonies in, but I suppose if you sneak in to the almond I've, pollination. I've heard that it's all operator by operator. Like some of them really care and some of them really don't. I think it depends like how, you know, how hard it is to get colonies that year and how far they're, you know, the, the, the orchards are from people and some people care and some people don't. Cause I mean, there's the, around San Diego, like there's just, it's, it's all Africanized bees. And so they just got used to them. I mean, for a long time, like they were doing constant requeening and some people still do that, but then there's a bunch of beekeepers down there that have just, you know, they just are Africanized beekeepers now. I had a colony last year that, um, you know, of course, there's no way to tell for sure, but I'm I'm fairly sure that there was a there was a component of Af Africanized genetics in that colony. It was crazy. It, uh, you know, you, you'd walk by it and they would they chased us like you know, 60 yards to the car and you had to like jump in the car and drive away. They were still following us. It was, it was really alarming. Yeah, they can, be dealt with. they can <laughs> become increasingly Africanized because the, it's not like an all or nothing thing because the queen, the European queen will fly out and mate with 12 males. And so you can get the case that one or two of those males was Africanized, but the others were European. So the colony can be, you know, Sort of intermediate in its aggressiveness between the, the between between being typical European bees and Africanized bees. Some European bees are just mean though. Like the first guy that I worked with, Nick Calderon at, at Cornell. If you guys have, have heard of him, but he loved mean bees, and they were totally European bees, but they were just mean. Like you would drive up in a truck, at least forty yards, they would already be attacking the truck. You know, they were just, they were terrible. They weren't, they weren't Africanized terrible, but, but they were terrible. They were like way, way more aggressive than you typically find for, for European bees. One of our speakers, Wally Shaw from Anglesey, Wales, keeps black bees. And he said that they're more feisty. I've heard that as well. I haven't worked with those bees before. Not, not in Europe. I mean, we have, you know, that originally the, that was the bee that was brought here. But um, <clears throat> now it's thought that most of the, Genetics are from Lingustica. But people have done studies, you know, and you can't really, because somebody says they sell carniolans or they sell, you know, Caucasians or, or what have you, you know, it, it's often just their bees are this color or that color and like, but it doesn't necessarily correspond to the genetics. You, it's better just to sort of think about managed bees as being hybrids of all of the, the European subspecies. I mean, some of them can be, you know, more or less pure Lingustica or carniolans, but, Many of them are not. 
it's actually probably a good thing. I mean, the the hybrids tend to do, I mean, they're more genetically variable and they might do better than the than the than the, the single population source bees. I'm interested to know if you could share a little bit about like what your job consists of. How much are you like analyzing bee genetics or how much are um, different beekeepers coming up to you to help solve problems? Like what, what's your life like? Well, I'm sort of, a, we have two, two honeybee scientists at, at Davis. Alina Nino is the, um, the extension person. So she works with, um, with beekeepers, both commercial and hobbyist beekeepers. And so she's sort of more in tune with like applied, applied research and also stakeholders, which are the, you know, the, the beekeeping communities. I'm more of a, a classic research professor in that I do basic science with, with honeybees. And so I, 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 you know, my split of activities is maybe 75% research and 25% teaching. And I don't have an outreach component. That's not, I don't have a formal outreach component anyway, beyond what all professors do. I mean, all, all professors are supposed to do, you know, outreach to the community. And naturally for me, the outreach means I enjoy talking to beekeepers. And so I'd much rather talk to beekeepers than some other outreach, you know, some other outreach group. But, but for me, sort of, because I do basic science, I have sort of more of a classic science professor job than does somebody who does applied bee research. And then what's the lay of the land for your peers? Like how many basic beekeeping science professors are there in the country? Like what does that community look like? It's a big community, you know, by the standards of academia, you know, like um, it's hard to say. I mean, most universe, most big universities have a honeybee scientist. And it used to be before CCD, it was almost all basic science. Like before CCD, applied science with bees was a very small field. And it wasn't considered kind of a prestigious field. It, they, were, they didn't get a lot of funding and they didn't get top jobs necessarily. And then CCD made that field cool, you know, and, and tons of funding flowed into it. And so now they're, of the people being hired, maybe it's, 50-50 between people that do applied research and basic research on honeybees. Honeybees are good for basic research because in science, we're always looking for, you know, lab, we're always looking for model systems that are easy to work with, like amenable to study. Like it's, that's why people study mice or the fruit fly. It's not because they're interested in fruit flies, for example. Fruit flies are just really easy to keep in the lab. They're easy to breed. They're easy to control and manipulate. The honeybee is also really easy to keep. You can, you know, you could, there, we, we know so much about beekeeping that it's easy to keep the honeybee. They have really cool behavior. They're very amenable to study. And so if you want a model system for social behavior, the honeybee is a really great model, yeah. sort of independent of, you know, the applied aspects, just in terms of having an animal that you can work with easily that has really derived and cool social behavior. The honeybee is a very natural choice. And so there's always been people from Von Frisch, you know, in the early part of the last century till now, there's tons of people that study the, the honeybee as a model for basic social behavior. Wow. It's interesting that I've never heard of that. I've heard of the fruit flies and the mice all the time, but I don't hear about honeybees being used that way. Yeah, so Von Frisch showed that, you know, the honeybee, the, the early work on color vision was all done on honeybees. And lots of stuff and learning and memory, the honeybee is the model for that. Things with division of labor and, and caste differentiation, polyphenism, like the queen worker morphological differences, how those are genetically controlled. The honeybee is a model for that. The honeybee is a model for, lo for lots of things. It's not as famous as Drosophila. I mean, Drosophila is like the, 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 the mouse of the insect world in terms of genetic model. But after Drosophila, the honeybee and a couple other insects are sort of the most well studied just below that. So by academic standards, lots of people study honeybees, but that's not a lot of people by like real world standards. Like if you're famous in the honeybee world, it means hundreds of people, you know, know you and know your work. It doesn't mean like, like you're like Brad Pitt or somebody where like millions of people like, so when people say like a famous honeybee scientist, they, they mean, you know, like there are hundreds of other honeybee scientists all over the world that, that you know, are familiar with their stuff. Like when we go to our conferences, we have a social insect conference. 
that's an, an international conference that the scientists go to to present their work. And they're usually about five, 600 people there. That's kind of like the side. And then, you know, at any given year, half the people show up for those things. And so maybe there's a community of maybe a thousand scientists or so that, that study social insects and, 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 and the honeybees are the, the most well studied of the social insects. Cool, thank you. Well, we've kept you on quite a long time. If you're, uh, if we've exhausted you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually, uh, no, I, I enjoyed, you know, talking to you guys. I'm pretty tired because like I said, I usually go to sleep around eight because you know, the, the baby wakes up at their own times so and they can't be reasoned with and so. <laughs> but yeah, I look forward to, you know, coming out and talking in person again, you know, when, when we, you know, when we cross that bridge, whenever that happens. Oh yeah, one quick last question. Is there any UC Davis programs about honeybees that you would like us to visit? Or you know, Alina has a master beekeeper course and she also has a queen brewing course that are really popular. So I would encourage you to, you know, to maybe look into both of those. Cool, thanks. Uh, we're, we're definitely planning to have Dr. Nino uh, later in the year. Uh, it's not clear to uh, me quite yet uh, when we'll have in-person uh, meetings again, but we're looking forward to it, at least indoor uh, meetings. Yeah, everybody has to be comfortable. At Davis, we're starting in-class in instruction without masks next quarter. Like now we have classes with masks and then next quarter we're gonna try it without masks. And, and not everybody's thrilled about it. And so, you know, it's one of those things where you have to, you know, balance everybody's, you know, everybody's needs and, and desires. Fingers crossed we won't be hit by another variant. Yeah. Well, okay, well, thank you for having me. Well, thank you very much for uh, taking your time out of your evening for us. Yeah, I look, I look forward to, see, to doing it again.